you were talking about also how how important it is to communicate and not to communicate what you're saying but just because when you're not communicating people or you're not even visible to somebody well that somebody usually thinks you're not doing anything this is the leadership foundry podcast i'm your host this week brandon smith and our guest this week is tobias hoffmeister tobias is the president and ceo of mhp americas they're a global consulting company owned by Porsche. Uh, and Tobias has had the unique experience of being a global leader working in many different countries. And he now runs this division for MHP in Americas. And what makes it unique is he has to then interface with the home office back in Germany. So our conversation today is all about the challenges of being a global leader, running a country unit, and then having that dynamic and relationship with the home office. Take lots of notes. I sure did. Really pay attention to some of the competencies that Tobias mentions are critical for global leaders today and how we manage that dynamic because it's a challenging one. But done well, it can really help you and your business thrive. So excited to have you on the show today. You and I have known each other for a few years now, four years actually, uh, and really got to work together during the pandemic. And I've always admired the work that you do. And so uh, really excited to have you on the show today and share a little bit about your uh, leadership journey and your leadership lessons. So thank you for coming on, my friend. Brandon, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm extremely excited. I uh, when, well, when you invited me, I already said, I don't know how we're going to squeeze all our discussions into 30 minutes, but uh, let's go and give it, we can give it a try. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, part of what I, I find just so fascinating about you know, your, your work and what you do is you're doing something that uh, a lot of leaders listening to this have had to do at some point in their career. They've, they've had to go and take a business model and put it into another country, another culture, kind of grow it and lead it. And then also manage that relationship with the home office. Um, if you're in a global environment, you, you've, you either have had to do that or you've have leaders and colleagues that have had to do that. So I'm really excited about kind of you sharing some of that, uh, firsthand with us today, Tobias. So, so maybe a good starting place, uh, for folks that maybe aren't as familiar with MHP and, and what you do, uh, share a little bit more about your journey. Right. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's um, so I'll, I'll focus on MHP for a second. I mean, MHP, the, the letters themselves stand for Mishka Hoffman and Partner, and we're a 100% Porsche owned company. We're a consulting company. We focus on management and technology consulting. And we do work with pretty much all manufacturing and mobility companies um, on this planet. We're the leading consulting company in that space, mm -hmm. founded in Germany. That's where my born and born and raised in Germany. That's where my accent comes from. Um, but I've lived internationally, and I think that's also where your your other part of the question kind of went. Um, I've I've worked in probably well more than twenty countries. I've lived in more than ten countries, um, and and or I've, I've I've been involved also in work in in different three different continents. And I think my my background has always been in the consulting space, and then focused on either the sales, marketing, after sales side of the business, or the manufacturing, engineering, logistics side of the business. And that's what MHP is very strong at from end to end, as we call it, from the engineering to manufacturing logistics to the customer experience space, and then anything that's data related. Wow. Okay. So what, what brought you, let's, let's get uh, more uh, recent and, and relevant to the last few years. At what, what was the pivot point that brought you to the United States? What was, tell us a little about that tap on the shoulder and what you were asked to do. Yes. So I think, and, and I, I was, I keep thinking back at what was actually a moment in my life that made me realize that I wanted to not stay in Germany forever, but also move abroad. And I think that was my, uh, when I was a teenager, I went to the US um, as as a 15 year old on an exchange with uh, Rotary. And, and I liked it so much that I think that opened up my, just the, me being open to also do it again. And when in my career, moments came where either my bosses or said, well, could you envision going to another country or where an opportunity, opportunity arose? Uh, I, I was more open to even entertain that thought. And I think I, I lived and worked in China for five years. Uh, the reason why we went over there was because my wife got the opportunity or the offer to go to China. And I said, well, you know what? That sounds exciting. Let's let's do it. And, and we decided together to go, but I didn't have a job. And that's how I ended up in China. I was a partner, equity partner of a, a consulting company there. But that was basically me going over there and starting as patient zero, uh, renting office space, getting the business license, 
understanding where you could have a, a bank that wants to open an account for you. And, and so really from the basics to my current position now, which I, I, and I've had several of those moments where I started up, started from scratch, but now my current position took over a 50 people strong consulting company in the US that was already very successful and, and brought this from the 50 people to well, 150 people that work for us now in the US and, and we're continuing to grow. Um, and I, I think the reason why I was very excited when I got this offer was just that I thought, hey, this is something where I can coin an organization where I can actually use the skills that I've gathered over the years and yeah, and make that company more successful than it currently is. Yeah. So adaptation clearly is a big theme in your journey, Tobias, being able to adapt to different cultures, different situations, both life of the business, as well as how do we make this thrive in this particular context, whether it's China or the US or any other country you've been in. So as you think about some of the big leadership lessons you've had in your career, given you've been in so many different environments and you've had to adapt. What have been some of your learnings? What have, what have been some of the big ones that you've learned about either about yourself or you've learned just about leadership? That's a, that's a very good and deep question. The right question, of course, for this podcast. When I think about my leadership skills, I always think about what I'm not good at. So it's yeah. a, um, and I think that may also be one of the leadership traits that I have. I, I don't think I'm a great leader um, or I wouldn't say, Here's the five things, and if you do those right, then you're a great leader. It's more that I'm. I think I'm very critical with what I'm doing, and I'm I'm reflecting a lot on why did something happen, and how can I do this differently, i.e., better going forward. So I think I think, and that's not an answer to your question, but that's just my mindset. And and um, and when it comes to innovation, that's that's also where my head's usually at. That I think, well, what was good in the past may not be good in the future, and and that's also having lived in different countries, I realized that. Many people on this planet do things differently, but they're still successful. So that's that's for me, but a leadership trait. Now, when I have to say, what are the three main leadership things that I learned over the years? I do think focusing on the moment is important. I think from a leadership perspective, being able to focus on the conversation that you're having, on the presentation that you're doing, on the on the topic that you're working on is key. So when I talk to my employees, I show them appreciation because I'm listening. I'm not writing emails left and right or taking picking up other calls. So, and and it's it's attention and it's also compartmentalizing. So it helps me also stay sane because I can focus on different things. So that's one. Um, I think the other topic is inspiring and motivating. I think that's that's for me another uh, topic which for me as a leadership or as a leader, what is important. So making people feel heard is one, then inspiring and motivating is probably the second. And and trying to share experiences with my team, making sure that they understand why I made certain decisions or how I would react in their way, not prescribing, but rather challenging them and holding them accountable. I think that's a second trait or a second strength in leadership. And hey, with my background, I provoke change. I, I do enjoy uh, going into situations and changing them f- to a better state. Now, mm-hmm. the, and change is never done, right? It's never, I, at least, and, and again, it comes back to my initial statement. For me, I don't think I'm a perfect leader. I learn a lot. I still learn. I mean, you and I, we met when I was most eager to learn and I asked him, you help me. Uh, and, and I think, and, and even now, four years down the road, I think I, I, I'm still learning, listening to your podcast, right? <laughs> and, I, and I still, it's that open mindset, I think that that's helping too. I want to dig in on a couple of these. You, you mentioned inspiring and motivating. Yeah. And since you have a unique experience of having worked in lots of different cultures. Right. Does that vary uh, depending upon the culture on how you inspire and motivate? Or are there just some general human truths that you've noticed when yeah. you're doing that? Yeah. It's a very good point. So I think, so authenticity and that's one of our company values. And I, I didn't create them. I were created in a bigger group, but I think authenticity is important. And now if you try to adapt to please a, let's say Chinese audience, Chinese management team, or try to adapt to please a US management team, a Mexican management team, you're not authentic necessarily, right? So the, a big challenge is that in doing so, you're potentially not doing what you think is right, but what you believe somebody else or the culture requires from you to be right. And now that's it's, that, that sounds a little abstract maybe, but just to give you an example, 
everybody, when you talk about China and doing business in China, for example, I, I had been told by somebody who'd studied in China and was still good friends 20 years ago. Um, she started, or 25 years ago, she started in China and she speaks Chinese. And she always said, well, be careful, right? There's a lot of reading between the lines. You have to be careful and very subtle with what you say. Now, I think most people get that recommendation over time when working with an Asian culture. And it was very subtle. I try to be very mindful and, and that's good. And that's very important. At the same time, one of the best leaders I worked with in China at, at one point in time slammed his fist on the table in a meeting and said, I've had enough. Now, this is what I want. And I think it was a challenging moment for some of the Chinese management team around him. And I, and I was just a bystander. I was just watching this situation. But I, so I see this person hitting the table, me thinking, oh, gosh, this is just going to go south now because the Chinese are going to be upset. They're going to be um, intimidated. And in fact, the opposite occurred. And, 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 the, and they opened up and they said, well, we understand that when he's frustrated, he can't hold back his emotions, one. Two, they realized, I said, well, there's no holding back now. We need to have an open conversation about what's going wrong. And then three, actually, the end of the meeting was that they said, all right, we know that once we go beyond a certain point, he will flip. And, and they understood that when that's not happening, they're also still operating in a, in, a, in a good environment with him. Now, so back to your question, I don't think going into China or the U.S. or me being German, going to Germany, pretending to be somebody that you're not helps. Of course, there's certain absolute no-goes, and most people would probably say slamming your fist on the table is a no-go in most cultures. And at the same time, I would argue there's hardly any no-go, but it's, it needs to also fit your character to be authentic. Mm. So finding that balance between kind of being be authentic yep. and, and try to avoid things that might be off-putting or derailing. Yeah. In that case, you know, he, that's kind of a good example. He was kind of put this this down yeah. and kind of let everybody know, okay, he's it. That's, that's it. That's it. I think I've never done that in any leadership meeting, by the way, just to be just kind of like an off the record statement. But uh, so it's not that I would recommend this to anyone, but it was just for me, a interesting, interesting observation. And I think that's true for most cultures that there's some things which, and it always depends on your team, right? If you work with a soccer team or a rugby team, I think the you know, football team, you probably ha can be a little bit more blunt, a little bit more direct than if you're working with a very, um, a uh, fragile team where people are very um, empathetic, but also very careful on, on trying to read between the lines and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want to also talk about something else too. You and I have had some conversations around it. It's a, it's a, it's a important leadership competency when you lead a global business and you're, you know, running kind of a country or a region, you've got to communicate back to the home office. You've got to communicate back to kind of corporate. Let them know what's going on, give them updates, um, and manage that dynamic a little bit. So I'd be curious, what, what pieces of advice would you have for leaders that find themselves in that seat? I work with a lot of global companies where, you know, the headquarters might be in one country and then they've got, they've got country leaders in Singapore, Australia, um, Europe, uh, you know, and, and they've, they've got to manage all of this. So yeah. what might be some pieces of advice that you have? That's a that's an excellent question, and I think you and I, when we started working, and even over the time, and and I believe just in your one of your recent podcasts on on curiosity, you would you were talking about also how how important it is to communicate, and not to communicate what you're saying, but just because when you're not communicating, people or you're not even visible to somebody, well, that somebody usually thinks you're not doing anything. So I I and I tell this to my team as well. I say, guys. If you don't communicate with me, if you don't tell me what you've done, I don't know. And, and there's no way for me to know other than to make assumptions. So to answer your question in an international context, I think one of the key measures of success or key, key paths to success is really to strike the right balance between not over communicating, but also not under communicating. If you over communicate, then you may share information that is more frightening. Because again, the people only have a very limited knowledge about what's happening in your world, in your country, in your region. But if you under communicate, they will also assume that you're not doing anything that you may not even have it under control. And spinning this or controlling, not spinning, but controlling a narrative in that setup is so super important. And I think it's something that when I started my role four and a half years ago, I wasn't aware of 
um, then. I wasn't aware of how important that is and how much of an, and it's when we started talking, when we started working together, I realized I needed to communicate more because just doing the right thing all the time may be great and may lead to success long-term, but it may completely destroy everything in the midterm because some people may think, well, I don't even see that you're doing anything, right? I'm not, I, I don't, I don't, it destroys confidence. So I think striking that right balance is key. Okay. I love that to be a, and so I, I, I thought of another question and I don't know if there's a right answer to this question. So yeah. may, this may just be a question with no right answer, but some of my client organizations that my leaders work in, um, they have a certain kind of appetite for communication. So mm -hmm. some organizations, they only want to hear, um, positive. I, mm -hmm. I want to hear what's going on well. Yeah. Um, and, and they, they want to hear that other organizations share more with what kind of what's, what's broken. Yeah. Um, and it kind of, kind of speaks to the point you just said, you know, we, we don't want to over communicate because yeah. that could frighten. We don't want to under communicate because that right. could frighten. Yeah. Uh, and so there's this balance and in that balance, some of it's yeah. positive things, yeah. some of it's not so positive. So do you have a recommended mix? If we were cooking at home and we were going to put these ingredients in the, in the recipe, how much problems do you share and how much wins do you share? Is there, is there a right balance? That's a that's an excellent question. I I, I just this week and I, I mentioned that I work for MHP, but MHP owned by Porsche. I did a Porsche experience and I had some CEOs over. So it was seven, we were seven CEOs and we were talking over dinner. And one of my friends made the comment. He said, the best advice I can give you in negotiations is just don't say anything. So I think and, and 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 it's it's not my natural not to say anything. I, I I'm somebody who over communicates. So to answer your question, what is the right mix? What's the right recipe? That's difficult. Um, I think from a negotiation standpoint, if you're in a situation where you want to negotiate, where you have something that you want to get out, well, you have to listen to what the others are saying, what they what they're thinking, where their heads at. You have to ideally not say too much, and in fact, asking the question of, well, tell me, like, where's your head at, or like, what what are you thinking? And then waiting is probably a good good advice, generally speaking, and also in this international relationship, because very often you don't know where their head's at because you haven't been there. In fact, for me, one of the challenges is I often get pulled in into situations where somebody's already made up their mind. They've been told facts, be they right or wrong. They've heard some information, they got some data points, and they come to me in a meeting, global meeting, and they think they already know everything. So now for me, one of the key things is in that recipe to say, all right, help me understand what is your understanding of the situation. So in a good meeting, I manage that. In a, in a not so good meeting, I get in a, into a defensive corner and then I and then I start communicating and I start, try to frame the situation I, and I may over communicate. And over communication is always a tricky thing because sometimes it may add value because people all of a sudden hear things they didn't know, they weren't aware of. But in a leadership, in, in a when I communicate with a board, with let's say the senior leadership, they don't want to hear too much, right? They don't want to hear me explain anything and they want to just understand the situation and make a decision. So, so it's a trust thing as well, right? So it's not only, but it's, it's a, it's a trust thing. And you probably have to look at how much do you trust the other person? How much do they know you? And that's what I usually look at. So coming back to that recipe, not saying too much when you're unsure of what the other side wants is probably key. Second, Understanding what your trust level is with somebody on how deep you may want to open up is, is a second thing that I usually look at and where I try to understand what do I want to share? How much can I share? Um, and, and then be truthful. So now, and, and, and so I'm a Rotarian. I've been with Rotary for, for uh, a long time now. And, and one of the core values is that we always ask, is it the truth? There's four questions that we ask at the beginning of every meeting. Well, the first question is, is it the truth? Now, in an international relationship, you don't have many chances to prove that you're a trustworthy person. So trying to spin things in a certain way, trying to sugarcoat things, my personal advice is always, that's not good, right? It's it's like the bare facts help. Now, at the same time, when you ask me, you said, well, what what else? Like, what is that? Like, how do you how do you spin this in a, or how do you manage this relationship in a good way? I, I, I strongly believe that it's it's, you have to know what to say to whom, um, but also then physically meet face to face. And I think that's the third piece right next to this whole negotiation thing that I said, not over communicating. Second thing being understanding who to trust and what to say in which 
setup. It's having face-to-face -face meetings. At, at least, well, in my in my setup, I try to go over to Germany three, four times a year, and I I struggle sometimes because it may not be value add on the operational side for me here locally, but to actually have proper conversations that is very important too. Yeah, I, something you said as you were kind of answering that question made me think he's he's spot on. It's so right. I gave you this kind of challenging kind of question and you handled it masterfully. Of you, do, we, do we share positives, negatives? What, what do we share? And, and essentially one of the ways you answer the question was you said, don't guess, mm -hmm. you know, ask either ask the question or try and determine what they need to know in that situation. Uh, and then you also said, if you don't trust the person, then you, you might just be a little more on the responsive side, but not necessarily proactively share things. Yeah. But I love the idea of asking the question to just learn, you know, what, what would you like to get out of our conversation today? Or, or right. what do you know about the situation? So then yep. you get a sense of what their beliefs and assumptions are that they're coming in with. And then yep. you can either redirect those, uh, um, reaffirm those or whatever you might need to do. So yep. I think that's, I think that's fantastic. Okay. So to be as we're getting close to landing our plane, but before we do, I've got a couple, I've got a, a, a couple questions for you. All right. So I want to, I want us to look out a little bit into the future, right? So we're going to look out into, I don't know, 2025 and beyond. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe the next three to five years. Yep. I, I think leadership is such an evolving thing because certain leadership competencies and traits yeah. either become fads or become necessary in certain situations. Yep. So as you look out into the next five years and you think about global leadership, what do you, if I had to put you on the spot? and say, you got to pick one critical trait that you think leaders really need to have to be yeah. successful in a yeah. global environment in the next five years. Right. What do you think it is? So, and I, I firmly believe that with my background, and I, I had to adapt a lot, that the ability to adapt and, and the ability to embrace change and innovation in, in a very constant and ongoing setup, right? So in a, in a world where things are constantly changing, you have to embrace change and innovation and see it as an opportunity. And I think that's, for me, the next two years, or the next 10 years, that is an absolute key trait, a key characteristic that every leader needs to have. And at the same time, of course, then you need leader. And that's what I think sometimes gets forgotten. There's also hypes, there's trends, there's AI. Think about ChatGPT. Everybody says, "Oh, this is we all need to now use ChatGPT." I often at a C level conversation push back and I say, "Well, for what?" So, so there's sometimes also short term trends, and there's legacy or um, experience in an organization. There's there's also ways how things have been handled, and you can't just overrule everything. And just say, "All right, the newest thing is now the the the." Key key to solving every every challenge. But so from the next two years and beyond, I think it, it'll remain extremely important to embrace change and innovation. Yeah. And so what I, if I was to sum up what you said, what I love about it was you talked about the importance of adaptation, yeah. the ability to constantly be able to adapt on a regular right. basis. And here's the great news for everybody. That's a muscle that we can develop. Everybody can become more resilient. Everybody can be more adaptable. But it doesn't just happen if you do the same things over and over again. It it requires exercise. So yep. I'm hearing you say we got to constantly exercise. But then you also added a subtle point in here. You didn't quite say it this way, but you you need to embrace innovation and adaptation intentionally. Don't Correct. do it just because it's a, a a trend or a fad. Yes. Do it yes. because you see the reason why you're doing it. We're going to use this to go forward. So we're going to adapt in this way, not yep. just because everyone else is doing it too. I, Which I, I, I use, use it. Yeah. Leader, leader. yeah. It's, and, and, and that's a perfect summary. And, and for me, when I talk to my team, I often bring up the example of plastic. I think there was a time in the 60s where the world believed that plastic was the this it was the savior. Everything would be possible now. We could build houses made from plastic. We could build anything made out of plastic. And I think there were, I mean, there were cars in the eastern German. Uh, in the GD, um, in, the, in the Eastern German world, where you had a overuse of plastic, but my point is, 
over time, people realized that wasn't going to change the world and everything. And people are still sitting on chairs. They're not going to now, well, sit on some weird plastic thing that feels like a chair, but there's certain things that just remain as they are. And, and but it was integrating it where it was most useful that made made prog made the society progress. And it's the same with AI, with technology, that some of those things are going to be awesome. And I think Elon Musk and there's some other people, when you look at what they're doing, that's amazing. And it's and it is gonna they're gonna continue to trailblaze. And in their separated worlds, that's important. And they need to go on and be at the far front of things. Now, when when I talk to a manufacturing company in Mexico or in in Alabama or wherever it may be, then well, this whole idea of AI, that's fantastic, but they have actual problems to solve. And then it's really to add, they need to ask themselves, what of these great things can we actually impl implement in our small world to make a positive change? And sometimes, honestly speaking, there's not too much that they can do. There's other things that they need to do, right? So it's not that innovation changes and improves everything, um, but it's the, the openness to actually entertain the thought of innovation and change and then making elaborate sound decisions versus just well adapting whatever's out there. So I think I think that's yeah, you, you yeah. got it spot on. Okay. Here's my last question for you to be as I ask all my guests on the Leadership Foundry podcast this question. What is one thing that leaders can start doing today that will help them and their teams tomorrow? So if you got one kind of practical tip or life hack for leaders, what's one thing that you think they should start doing? I include myself, listen more. Okay. And what does that mean to you when you say listen more? Well, and so I, I come back to your, your podcast on curiosity. It's, it's asking good questions. I come from a background where my, my father and my mother, they, they are in professions where they do ask a lot of questions to actually understand why people have come to them. One is a doctor, one is a therapist. And that is a trait that some leaders don't have. In fact, when I started my role, I thought I needed to know everything and I needed to actually tell everybody what they needed to know. And I'm, I'm not, I, again, I'm, I'm still learning, I'm still adapting, but I realized that very often asking my team what they think should be done is the most crucial thing. It's actually listening to them and understanding what they think the main issues are is sometimes a lot, was most of the times so more valuable than me trying to make assumptions and being a leader just by being smart. Yeah, could be a, fantastic. This was an absolute gift. Thank you, my friend, for coming on the show. Really thank love so hearing not only your journey, but your uh, lessons along the way. So thank you for the gift that you've given me today and everyone listening. Brent, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. So Bias really highlights in our conversation some of the challenges of being a global leader. Now, some things he mentioned, I think, are just universal truths as leader. He talked about some of the critical things that he thinks are so important. He says, focus on the moment, really be present. I think we want that in all of our leaders. Uh, be inspiring and motivating. He talked about that. And he also talked about just having an open mindset. So I think we would all agree that those are leadership traits we'd want to see anywhere. And then we dug in a little bit and I started asking him questions about cultural differences around inspiring and motivating. How do you do that? And he said, well, authenticity is key. If you're leading in another country or, or culture, while there's a tendency to want to kind of be and show up the way they want you to be, be yourself. He said, that's really, really important. So he reminds us, we still need to connect as human beings. He also talked about some of the challenges of communicating back to corporate. And we had some great discussion on the right amount. We don't want to give too much information. That worries them. We don't want to give not enough information. That worries them. Kind of just the right amount of information. And he said the key there is and ask questions. Try and identify what do they what do they need to get out of this conversation so you can respond uh, accordingly. And of course, evaluate your level of trust with that person. And then as we started to kind of round out our conversation, he talked about the importance of always being adaptable as a global leader, always being able to adapt to the changes and doing that intentionally. And then he said, one of the, again, the things where we can start doing tomorrow to really help us with our teams, listen, listen more. I think we can all get better at that. Listening is one of those things that uh, it's kind of like driving. We all think we're pretty good at it. We're probably not as good as we think we are. So I love my conversation with Tobias, regardless of what I took away. The real key is what did you take away? What was that one thing you heard Tobias talk about that you either want to start doing, stop doing, or continue doing tomorrow? that's gonna to help your team thrive 
as we move further into the year.